I'm going to talk about the bright insights in the nano world. Uh, so that is what I'm going to able uh, to present. I will give a short introduction. I will have selected a few examples of what we have done, or even uh, a couple of examples we are doing now. Uh, and uh, at the end, I hope I have to have a few minutes to say why uh, the upgrade of the SRF is important for our research. So I'm working in the physical and colloid chemistry. So this is the definition of colloid. So anything between a nanometer and a micrometer is the world of colloids. Okay, so this is this are example of several colloidal particles. It is the hair of our PhD student, Martin Branson, who made these photos. Uh, and it contains one silica particles, a little bit larger than a micrometer, particles that are 10 times smaller. You can see them over here. And those little guys over here with the high resolution, you see them better. Uh, these are the gold uh, nanoparticles. So uh, basically, some people say we are, we are developing nanomaterials. Some people say we are working in soft matter. But these two fields actually are overlapping very much because that is everything about the structure in, in your uh, system on the scale of from a nanometer to a micrometer. And to my mind, colloids are in the heart of both fields. And uh, well, now I'm giving this talk just a few months after the announcement of the Nobel Prize. Uh, and for chemistry, the Nobel Prize for chemistry was uh, awarded to these three gentlemen for uh, uh, the discovery of the synthesis of quantum dots. And this is one of the examples I'm going to start with in my lecture. So the, uh, the simplest model described in all textbooks about if you, if you wanna grow a little particle is uh, the nucleation and growth model you say that, okay, we, uh, if you have a solution with, uh, uh, which is oversaturated with the solute, and so there will be gain in energy if these molecules or atoms come together and start forming a bulk phase. However, so that is the gain they get However, you will also create an interface between the solution and the solid phase, and that will create the energy barrier, the nucleation barrier. And so basically the idea what people have in mind is that if you wanna synthesize a nice monodispersed particle, which are of the same size, because that is important uh, for their properties, you need to go fast over the nucleation barrier and then let them slowly grow to the right size. Um, you can play actually with uh, more, of course, the crystallography can play a role and particles are not necessarily spherical like in the simplest model, but they, um, uh, they, they have uh, different forms, cubes, truncated cubes, etc. Uh, you can also play with the surface uh, active agents, which can affect the shape very much like gold can grow in the form of a rod, although the underlying cube, uh, symmetry, crystallographic symmetry is cubic. Uh, so you can get different shapes. Uh, you can have size dependent phase transition. We studied at least one case where the smallest particle had one phase but then when they were growing, there was a phase transition and et cetera. So that is the, the complicates the whole process, but there is a lot of room for playing with these uh, parameters and to really engineer the uh, particles you, you can get in your synthesis. So from looking, say this is the, uh, if, if you compare, nanoscience with traditional chemistry, uh, we are basically moving from something which looks like a periodic table. We work with uh, uh, particular atoms, bring them together, form molecules. We start building materials out of that. 
Now we can actually do the same, but using nanoparticles, there's the building blocks. And here there is much more freedom in terms of the composition, size, shape, and the superstructure they form. So you can get uh, completely new materials which are not present in nature and have uh, new unique properties. So uh, we also study a lot the colloidal self-assembly. Uh, we are looking at the crystallization uh, of particles like spheres, but also uh, uh, other shapes into a crystalline phase. We were looking at uh, for some time. Now it is a little bit less active, but still we have done a lot of work with the colloidal liquid crystals, etc. And so we use this as the first of all to understand uh, fundamentally what's the process of the self-assembly uh, and uh, trying to see whether the structures we can get are useful for any particular applications and how to tune this uh, structure by playing with different parameters. So uh, I mostly do small angle X-ray scattering. So there was already a talk in the morning by Joanna, uh, so I don't need to explain much, I guess, but just one thing to mention is that when we uh, do a small angle scattering experiment, we basically look at different scales, depending on what uh, type of scattering angle we can uh, measure. We can, look, we can look from angstrom uh, scales at relatively wide angle, we call it wax, not sax. Uh, but then if we make angles, uh, scattering angles smaller and smaller, we look into the larger and larger structures and we can basically span uh, the whole uh, structural scales from angstrom to a couple of micrometers. Um, so coming back to the uh, Nobel Prize winning case, cadmium selenide. Uh, the first work was done by Abikasis at the ID2 beam line, so this is not our work, uh, but uh, they look in a capillary, basically fill all the ingredients in there, then heating it up to see uh, how the growth uh, proceeds. Um, uh, we were thinking that uh, because we use hot injection method, basically, uh, and it is believed that it is important that we do a very quick uh, injection of the uh, some of the ingredient into the hot solution so that to make the nucleation happen fast. And we wanted to reproduce the uh, conditions like what we do in the lab. So we develop a special uh, vessel to do this reaction, which contains a little uh, tube entering in uh, with a window at the end. And then there is a, like a couple of millimeter solution in between the two windows and it is all stirred so that uh, the, the, the solution is always moving. And so we are looking uh, in real time what is actually going on, uh, how this uh, uh, synthesis goes uh, in small angles and at the wide angles. And so uh, this gave us, the, this is the recent work, we, so we repeated this uh, Nobel uh, Prize case of uh, synthesis of cadmium selenide uh, dots, which are uh, yeah, called the working horse of nanoscience. This is one of the syntheses which is, was essential for awarding the Nobel Prize. Uh, so analysis of the small angle X-ray scattering data shown here uh, shows, uh, first of all, how the size of the particle change, how the concentration grows. So this is the nucleation. So you see that in all this region, nucleation goes up to, uh, what is this, 60 uh, seconds about. Okay, so while the particles 
are already growing and most of them are actually already reach almost the final size. Uh, and that was a bit surprising, not expected uh, that the hope was that the nucleation happens much faster. Uh, apparently we actually, we uh, from the scattering data again, we can see also the polydispersity and we see that the polydispersity is not increasing. And in fact, the, we, we have observed the super focusing effect that the larger particles, this basically start to grow slower than the smallest particles so they can catch up and we can reach uh, low polydispersity at the end of these uh, nanoparticles. Now my colleagues in, uh, our colleagues in Ghent are developing new extended um, synthesis technique to try to add the uh, ingredients for the growth uh, during the reaction. So then to extend the growth processes even longer, uh, et cetera. So that is the, the work we are doing. Now, uh, very briefly, this is the work in progress. Uh, the experiments are done, but we are still finalizing the data uh, analysis. So that uh, we looked at the hematite iron oxide particles there. They're, they're very interesting for many uh, reasons for their magnetic properties. It's quantitative ferromagnet. They have relatively low magnetization per volume but these particles, which are about a micrometer in size, they have sufficient dipole moments so that they start to feel each other. So they have also a magnetic interaction with each other, um, which affects the self-assembly process. Uh, one of the puzzles, which was for me shocking when I saw this, when I, my uh, colleagues showed the, the synthesis and uh, showed the, the uh, electron microscopy images like this, this uh, iron oxide has a uniaxial symmetry. There is nothing cubic in the in the crystallographic structure, so that shape cannot come from the from the crystallographic sy symmetry. So what we did, we came uh, for the first of all for the micro branch experiment, where we had a beam which was a little bit larger than a single particle, and then we were able to. Uh, look at the diffraction, not at the whole ensemble of different particles with different orientation, but really on a single particle level. And that uh, gave us the idea that, well, you see, there is a clearly preferential orientation of the crystallized. The crystallized actually, it's not single crystal in, in the sense that there is no positional ordering going through the whole particle. Uh, there is some little misorientations between domains uh, but still there is a clear preferential orientation. And these are the facets of the crystallographic facets where we determine actually the, 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 the shape of the cube. The cube is apparently not exactly a cube. One of the degree, uh, angles is a little bit smaller than 90 degrees. Uh, but that is, uh, so apparently these are the phases which are the slowest in growth, and so that is the what happened. Uh, by varying the conditions, you can also grow particles of different shapes, like ellipsoids, like uh, peanuts. And this is an example with the peanut particle. So this is a single particle. You see, it's like uh, two to three, two and a half micrometer long. Uh, it has the shape, and this is the result now by the scan with the nano beam through the particle. And what is plotted here is the total diffraction intensity. And you see that in different uh, parts of the uh, particle, there you see, well, something which resembles the result of the cube I showed on the previous slide. Oh, can I go back? Oh. You see that when we look at the whole particle, it looks more or less like a, a full rings of diffraction. Now here we can see the local orientation uh, within each piece of this uh, particle. And that is, that is very useful information for us. 
one slide about the what we are actually what we are just starting to do. I have a colleague, Martin Haase in Utrecht, uh, who is doing a very interesting uh, research on uh, forming this uh, bigel fiber, as he call it. Basically, what you do, you have a system where you have three liquids uh, mixed like water, this is the, I, I don't even remember how to pronounce that exactly, so I don't try to do that. It's an oily uh, stuff. This is water and this is a alcohol. Oh yeah, this is DD till but late. Uh, and this is the one of the alcohols which can mix nicely with water and with the oily stuff. And if you have enough alcohol present, then the three phases nicely mixed and we are in this part of the di phase diagram. However, when we extrude it into the fiber, and here there is a toluene uh, flowing around that smaller capillary, the solvent starts, the alcohol start to diffuse out, the system enters, uh, so the, the, the concentration of the alcohol uh, drops uh, and the system starts to go show spinodal decomposition and then they for, it forms a very nice structure where you have a bicontinuous uh, channels of two different phases of water, water rich phase and the oil rich phase which are interpenetrating into each other and there is a huge interface in between them and you can think of uh, many different interesting application of this. So we have already done a preliminary experiment thanks to Nana Yan who organized that. Uh, and these are the results of the preliminary measurements. So these are the intensity, scattering intensity profiles uh, at different positions uh, with respect to the uh, end of this capillary. And you see that this part is mostly dominated by scattering of, oh yeah, and we need nanoparticles here to stabilize the structure. I forgot to say that, uh, that the structure is then arrested in this uh, bicontinuous uh, way. And uh, where, when the, the, it is extruded, you see that at the smaller uh, angles, the, the, you see already the effect of the, that uh, in the beginning, the, in the solution, the particles were randomly distributed in the system, which is not yet phase separated. Once the phase separation occurs, the nanoparticles run to the interfaces and they absorb there. And then the correlation between particle position are clearly affected. And this is something what we could not do before. We can do the electron microscopy, the confocal microscopy, but already with fibers which are already pre-made. Uh, before uh, starting these measurements, now we can really follow the dynamics and uh, what exactly happens and what time scales uh, in real time and in situ. Uh, this is an example which is already some time ago uh, measured by basic. Uh, 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 we worked with the lead selenide. Uh, quantum dots. So uh, they they form this. They have these truncated cube shapes, and when you uh, when they absorb at the liquid air interface, uh, they start to self assemble into the structure like this. And at the end, they even uh, epitaxially attach to each other so that the atomic lattice of one nanocrystal becomes coherent, correlated with the atomic lattice of the uh, nanocrystal next to it, etc. You can even uh, see some of the atomic planes going from one nanoparticle to another nanoparticle. There was a question, what is exactly this, the, uh, the structure of these um, graphite-like structures? Uh, we did experiments, uh, well, the high resolution electron microscopy, supplemented by the Grayson incidence uh, <clears throat> uh, scattering uh, measurements at ID1. And that uh, in that work, we actually showed what exactly the 
the structure is so because these particles could attach using different facets and you see the resulting structure could be different. This one is not buckled, these two are buckled and the, the one which is actually the, the real case has even higher buckling. And I very much wanted to see how that buckling process happens, that particles absorb at the liquid interface, which is flat, but then at some point the particles has, some particles have to go up and some particles have to go down. Um, we didn't manage to, to get this graphite, uh, graphene-like uh, structure uh, in an in situ experiment, but we got how the, uh, so in a slightly different condition, we also can get a square lattice, square arrangement of the nanoparticles. And this is what we were able to catch by looking at the small angle and at the white angle. At the white angle tells us about the orientation of the particle Small angle tells us about the structure on the scale of several nanometers. So this is about the self-assembly into the structure. And we saw that this process goes through for formation of a first a hexagonal structure. You see nice, beautiful, sharp reflections. Then they seem to start blurring, but this is because that the hexagonal structures start to distort and the peak actually split uh, a little bit, and at the end we get uh, the square lattice. Um, this is another, uh, the last example I want to show. Okay, I'm still okay. So this is the self-organization of these um, silica particles uh, it is a collaboration with people in Oxford. Uh, and if I show you what the scale bar is, you can understand that in comparison with the X-ray wavelengths, these are huge elephants, right? So these particles are more than 10,000 times the wavelengths of the radiation we use to study. And this is the confocal microscopy image uh, because they are large, you can also see them in an optical microscope. Uh, we came uh, to Diamond, not to SRF, because SRF was closed in that time for the upgrade. So the first experiment was there. And while well, Diamond is also in the backyard of Oxford, so that was also convenient for my colleagues there. So um, we... The idea of the experiment was completely different, but that experiment started with the surprise that this is the sample capillary, uh, and we these are examples of measurement measurements of uh, in a one by one millimeter uh, mesh uh, in this uh, in this capillary. But when we also look at the different position, we also look we also were getting something which looked very similar. So basically it looks like a single crystal. You see, we have exactly the same beautiful uh, diffraction patterns all over the place, which was a big surprise. Uh, so we decided, hmm, that's interesting. Let's then uh, change our mind and do uh, another experiment to see how that happens. Uh, so we went to Diamond again uh, this is now, you see the pattern looks slightly differently, maybe not as nice as the one before, but this is because here the resolution was even better. Uh, so you start to see more details. Uh, and while we looked at the development of the diffraction peak, there are two types of peaks here. Uh, so these crystals are formed by hexagonal layers of particles. They are stacked on top of each other when you stack two layers, on, uh, when you stop another layer on top of the, the previous one, you have to shift it by one third of the period. And for some of the reflections, which we call rods, that is why the book, the, the letter R comes from, uh, you have an additional phase shift of 120 degrees in their contribution to the diffraction pattern. And so then you have 
well, not complete uh, uh, destructive interference, but there is no nice uh, uh, constructive interference. But in some reflections like this, noted with an S, we call them spot. This phase shift is equal either to zero or 360 degrees, so that uh, doesn't matter whether I come from layer A with the layer A position to the layer with B position or to the layer with the C position. They all of them will contribute with the same phase. And that is actually interesting because then we were able to follow the development of the intensity in these peaks. These are the spots. They are, uh, the intensity of the spots depends on how many layers I have organized and then how well they are in this uh, ABC, ABC position. Because if they are with the right shift with re relative to each other, their phases are then nicely the same and the interference is constructive. While here, at first grows, because I have more and more layers now self-organized, but once I start building up this correlation between the layers, the intensity goes down. We even build a model which exactly predicts this. And so the structure factor, which starts with one, when the layers are completely independent of each other, goes to one third for these uh, rod positions, while for the spot positions that grows. And so that is what we were actually able to follow real time uh, in this experiment. Uh, another surprising result, these were the results of the measurements after this sample was just placed in the, in, at the beam line, but we realized that after waiting a little bit, we actually saw that these crystals start to crush. So in fact, what we are observing here, this is one of the bottom positions that this crystal has the, feels the pressure from the all particles which are on top of this. And because of the gravity it is now being compressed and you can, uh, I zoom into one of them and you can actually see that what happens in the beginning is that this diffraction pattern stretches vertically, which means com uh, compression in the direct space. So first the crystal goes into the uniaxial compression, but then at some point, and this you can see also here, different lines correspond to different position, different height in the sample. And you see that in the vertical direction, the scale fact, uh, uh, sorry, in the uh, in the vertical direction, the this is how much the reflection stretch in the reciprocal space. So how much that is compressed in the vertical direction, it shows here. Uh, but here in the other direction, when you compress, it starts first to expand, but then at some point, the system goes too far away from the equilibrium crystal structure and decides to. Uh, go back to the uh, equilibrium uh, crystallography. And then what happens is that when the crystals start to contract in all directions, there is more space appearing, some crystal will fall into the appearing space, etc. So that is what uh, we can observe here. So uh, to summarize this part of the story, um, we find it interesting for us how, how, how that happens, but also we think there is an important analogy is that the colloidal crystals, they, they show, uh, they are structurally uh, very similar to metal crystals. Um, they have uh, similar close pack structures. They have similar uh, uh, defects which can be seen in, in the crystals, et cetera. So the difference is because between, is between the scales, we are now working with the particles like a micrometer in size, and we're comparing this to something uh, 
is the atomic scale of a couple of angstrom. And so it's very difficult to see to have an atomic resolution in, in these processes when you uh, compress and crush a crystal, a uh, metal crystal, but you can follow this easier using colloids. And also the scales are very different, like the phonon scales are in nanosecond, electronic uh, struct, electronic uh, excitations are more in the pico of femtosecond. Uh, the structural changes for colloids now shifted to the scales of seconds to hours, depending on the exact size. And so we can nicely follow this uh, development. So in this uh, uh, part of the story, which we still have to publish, uh, that is the uh, interesting implications uh, for maybe uh, for what happens with the metal crystals. So in a few more minutes, oh yeah, I'm not bad. Uh, I did a practice talk in Utrecht, I can tell you, last week. I was uh, 10 minutes too, too, too long or something like that. So I, I cut a little bit the story. So why extremely brilliant sauce? We do uh, mostly uh, traditional scattering or diffraction. And well, if you look at the, what changed at the, at the storage ring, we have the same current, we have the same amount of electrons running in between the poles of the uh, undulator. So in terms of the total number of photons, it's actually not that far from what it was before. It's all about the quality of the photons to my at least understanding is that now the photons are much more similar to each other. They have, because of the reduced uh, source size, they are much more running, much more parallel to each other, etc. And so you can ask if you don't use coherent properties directly, why extremely brilliant source is important. Well, um, for the colloidal crystals, uh, Look, I, we do diffraction. I did already many studies of uh, similar uh, uh, systems. And what we can learn from, from, a, a, from a, a diffraction at small angles, from the peak positions, also after rotating, I can even reconstruct this 3D structure. We know how the periodicities are built up in, in my systems. But if I want to look at the peak width, as that is also very interesting information for me, the inverse of the width of the diffraction peak is proportional to the correlation length in my uh, crystal. I hope it follows me, yes. So I made here a little model. Imagine these are my colloids, okay? These are my colloidal particle to create a, scattering pattern of this, if I take a low concentration uh, so suspension, I need the coherence on the scale of the particle so that the waves scattered on one side of the particles and the waves scattered on the other side of the particle, they come nicely to the detector, they can interfere. And for that, I need the coherent length so that the wave here and the wave here looks exactly the same, right? But now I'm building a crystal and I'm sometimes interested. I have crystals where this periodic order is span over 50 or even 100 periods of the lattice. So to really be able to see this uh, width of the diffraction peak, I basically need that all scattering coming from all the particles, they're still able to interfere at the detector. And for, so, and for that, if I want to see the interference between scattering by this yellow particle and that yellow particle on the other side, I need that my coherent length is larger than this distance, right? So that the scattering is still able to interfere at the detector. Uh, and so, and that means that for this type of studies, we actually need a pretty well uh, 
uh, good crystal with the long correlation length. Okay, we don't do coherent scattering. The beam is not yet fully coherent. It consists of patches which are fluctuating relative to each other, but the single patch has to be of a sufficient size. Uh, moreover, we also look sometimes in details of the peak, look at the diffuse scattering in between the peaks, and that tells us about fluctuations and disorder. And again, the better the quality of the beam, the cleaner you can make it, and the easier will be to measure something very small in between these sharp and strong break peaks. Uh, and of course, if I want to use micro and nano beam, like what we do at ID13, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's essential. The better quality beam can be nicely focused uh, into the smaller size. We need sometimes high energy uh, beams, for an example, of this catalysis of cadmium selenite uh, quantum dots. Uh, we, we have to go to high energy and we now have there also beams of sufficient quality. Uh, we can do time resolved studies and uh, especially if it is also combined with the extra requirement for the beam quality, sometimes you need to cut off some of the intensity and now this is becoming much easier with the EBS. So uh, this work these examples, I work already here for longer. There were more people involved. And this list is also uh, not exhausted, but at least these are the key players in the examples I have shown. There is a group of people in Utrecht behind these um, uh, studies, uh, which helped me with the chemistry side. I'm a physicist myself working in chemistry. Uh, and that is ideal situation for me. I have collaboration with Delft with people in Kent, uh, with Oxford, and of course the photon masters uh, here, the SRF is very important for us uh, to really reach what we can, what we want to do and what we want to see. So to conclude, I tried to convince you that colloids and nanoparticles are cool topics to, for the research and uh, despite the fact that it is already, well, the colloid science is known already for uh, 100 years or so, uh, it still remains a hot topic, especially with all the nano developments, nanoscience, nanomaterials. Uh, there is a lot of interest in the, uh, and colloids for photonic application, for new electronics, for, many other uh, examples. And here I basically stole this uh, phrase from Louis Armstrong, slightly rephrased it to apply it to our research. And I'm very excited to do this fundamental research. And I always like to stress the first three letters in the word fundamental. Uh, in the particle synthesis self-assembly, studying the order parameters, but it also actually has some potential applications. So it also uh, potentially applied uh, research and synchrotrons here are indispensable. Thank you very much. <laughs>